So in this crowd, there's, there's various types of people. We've got CFOs here, we've got CEOs, we've got controllers, we've got a few lawyers, we've got a few promoters. And so anybody who's involved in public companies will know that the financial statements of a public entity is, is a pretty integral part of its public filings. And so for everybody in this room to have some knowledge on IFRS is important. And we also want to know that this course is really only for about an hour and a half or so and then we're going to take questions, etc. And so it's not meant to encompass everything. IFRS is, is quite a large undertaking, and so it, we're here to just give you an idea that it's time to get started. Uh, however, as time goes by, we'll continue to have more consultations. In, in, your, in front of you on your seat, you have a copy of the, of the slideshow that we have in front of us. We know that probably the people in the back can't quite see the slide, so it's, it's a duplicate of the slideshow. Uh, you've also got a question card that you can feel free to write your question down and what we're going to do probably in about an hour or so we'll have a few people walk around and just raise your hand up and somebody can pick up your question card and we'll leave hopefully about 20 minutes or so in the end to take questions as you have them along. So as I'm going through the slides here, this is just an interesting point to note. You're going to start seeing in the handbook IFRS standards and IAS standards. Just so you know, anything before 2001, i.e. any standard that was pronounced then, is called IAS. Anything after 2001 is called IFRS. So there isn't a difference between those two, it's just that when it was implemented. And the interpretations are similarly SIC and IFRIC. The timeline for adoption, so this is important. As we sit here, I think it's October 27th today, and IFRS is being implemented on January 1st, 2011. So actually only just over two months away from now. So if you've got a December year end, which a lot of public companies do, then your first reporting period under IFRS is going to be March 31st, 2011. And, and we know now that there's going to be an extension for the deadlines for venture companies. So i.e., if you're typically filing in March quarterly, it would be due 60 days after the period end, which would mean the end of May. Uh, we believe that there's going to be a 30-day extension for companies. So it's likely you're going to have until the end of June. And of course, the reason why that is, is because the first interim statements under IFRS are going to look quite different than they did under Canadian GAAP. So what we need to note though, more just as important, is that when you file your first quarterly for March 2011, okay, your comparatives for December 2010 also have to be under IFRS. And that's something um, that's really important to remember because you don't have to just reconcile your quarterly but also your comparatives. And so with interim reviews typically are, are not audited. Uh, for many of our clients, we review the financial statements but you, you may want to really think on that first quarter to get us involved in it just because you're going to have to restate your December 31st numbers. And if you don't do that, you can sort of chuck along and do your March, June, and September quarterly. But then when we come in to audit your December 31st, 2011 audited statements and we find reconciliations, you might be in a situation where your last three quarterlies were incorrect. So the, the idea behind this is that while we don't have to provide an audit report until early 2012, you've got to get us involved now um, so you don't have to go back and potentially restate your quarterlies. Just a note, if some of you have access to Handbook Online, if you go on the CISA uh, section right now, you're going to see five different sections under there. You're going to see the IFRS as adopted by ISB. You're also going to see CISA's private enterprise gap. That doesn't apply to most people in this room. We're primarily dealing with public companies. But if you are involved in a private company, there is what's called private entity gap out there, which is not IFRS. Okay, private companies do not have to convert to IFRS like public companies do unless they choose so. Uh, there's also a CISA for non-for-profit, for pension plans. And then still existing is the CISA handbook, which is prior to the transition. And that's what we call now Canadian GAAP. A few staff notices, uh, if anybody likes to read this literature online. Uh, you see CSA 52320 discusses expected changes in the accounting policy related to changeover. Uh, 52321, uh, what sort of uh, considerations you have to do if you early adopt IFRS. 
What if you use US GAAP? And 52324 issues relating to the changeover. An important one that they did recently in July 2010 is 326. And really what they did is they looked at almost 200 public issuers and they, and they compared it to the guidance that 320 so effectively they looked at almost 200 public companies and they wanted to see what their IFRS disclosure was in the financial statements and in their MDMA. And the findings from that report was that more detailed disclosure is required and that more reviews are expected. So what we've seen a lot of public companies doing their quarterlies currently is still saying, yes, we've heard about this IFRS thing and, and we're thinking about it, but we're not quite doing anything about it yet. We haven't really thought about it, which is the easiest thing to do because that's what we've been saying for the last year. So we've actually seen some comment letter from the BCSC coming back and saying, well, you can't do that anymore. You gotta actually say what you're doing about IFRS. What, what are you doing for planning and transition? So if you've got a set of interim statements out there that you're filing today or tomorrow and, and it still says uh, IFRS is being implemented in 2011, but the effects of it have not yet been considered, you can't do that anymore. You have to start talking about it. So what should you be doing now, specific in the MDNA? Because that's where most of the disclosure is required. So the MDNA, you have to break it down into three sections. The first section is preparation, i.e. what are you doing to get your staff or your CEO or your CFO trained up to IFRS? And it's broken down into three phases, phase one, two, and three, which is broken down by initial scoping, evaluation design, and implementation and review. The second portion, the MDNA you're supposed to be talking about now, is state which exemptions are you going to be taking. So later on, we're going to talk about when you transition into IFRS, there's certain sections that you can elect to adopt prospectively, i.e. going forward, or certain sections that you can restate or retrospectively. So in your MDNA, you're required to state which sections you've elected to exempt or elect. So that's the second portion of it. The third portion is the impact of adoption i.e. now that you've selected your exemptions and elections, what do you, which accounts do you see as being potentially different under IFRS? And the guidance currently say that you should be quantifying it. However, in practice, what we've been seeing is companies typically just qualify it or qualitative. So for example, if you think there's gonna be a difference in your mineral property balance as you transition into IFRS, a typical sentence you would say is under IFRS, we believe our mineral properties be significant different than under Canadian GAAP. So in your MDNA, what you want to have is they broken down into those three sections. And you don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, some companies do it for pages and pages, but you just want to say something. You want to say what you're doing for the preparation, you want to talk about the elective exemptions, and finally you want to talk about the potential impact of adoption. For those here who filed 20 Fs, uh, or 40 Fs, i.e. you do Canadian GAAP and you reconcile to US GAAP. Some good news for you is that when, you, when IFRS is being applied in Canada, you do not have to reconcile to US GAAP anymore, so there is some relief there. Um, also, the SEC has extended the exemptions for the deadline, so typically when you file a 20 F or a 40 F, you're going to show, present three years of income statements and three years of cash flow statements. In the initial year of adoption, the SEC has granted a relief where you can only include two years instead of the three on the year of adoption, and then the following year you have to go back to the three years. What to get out of this slide is that if you do file a 20F upon adoption out of IFRS, you no longer have to reconcile to US GAAP. So a common question that we always get is, well, Everyone else is adopting IFRS. Why is in the U.S.? Why haven't they adopted yet? Uh, most of Europe has, Australia has, etc. So the United States has begun the process to converge this into IFRS, and the SEC is currently in the process, whether it be this year or next year, to decide whether or not the U.S. will adopt it at all. Uh, currently, it's slated to potentially be adopted from 2014 to 2016. That could easily change. Um, basically, the U.S. is not adopting IFRS yet. We think there are significant gaps between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. Uh, in the U.S., things always take longer. It has to go through Congress, etc. So Canada is adopting it, but the U.S. is not. I 
Okay, and I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Okay, I just wanted to, to uh, build off the point that I resonated about the extension that's expected for your first quarter. Um, <clears throat> we're generally talking about December's year, but that does apply for any of you who don't have a December year, and you January or February. That relief is still going to be applied to you, so you're still going to get the extra 30 day uh, extension. I just want to clarify that point in case you're not a December year. So from this point uh, forward in the presentation, what we're going to do is basically take you through a set of financial statements, sort of from beginning to end, um, just sort of like we have here. So I'm going to start off by just talking about some general requirements. Um, then we're going to take you through each statement and just sort of highlight some of the changes that you're going to expect to see on those statements. Um, and I'll just point out that the language uh, that's used up here, um, i.e. the statement of financial position, statement of comprehensive income and loss, um, that's the language that they use in the IFRS uh, uh, documents that you'll see. Um, we haven't seen anything to say, I mean, if you really want to call it a balance sheet, you know, I think you still can, but this is, this is the, uh, what, um, when you look at most IFRS statements that are out there, when you look in the literature, um, the IES's, IFRS's, and so on, this is how they refer to it. So that's why we chose it here. Um, so I'll go through the, the four statements. There's a, a fourth one here, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, there's notes to the financial statements. And then at the back, um, which is going to be for your transition, is explaining on transition um, all, what all the differences are. And really when we get to that note is when we're really going to be talking about, okay, what are the adjustments that um, a typical sort of junior company would expect to see? Um, and so we'll touch on that when we get to that, to that point. the wrong way. So just to start off uh, here, there's um, IAS 1, which is financial statement presentation. That refers to the financial statements as a whole, whether you're talking annual financial statements or whether you're talking uh, quarterlies. There is also um, IAS 34, and that's the guidance out there that relates directly to your quarterly. So it'll say what, what sort of things you want to see uh, in there. So I just want to clarify the, the two. On the first point um, there, this is part of what we sort of want to do with the course is when, when you guys have probably done some research, you've looked at other uh, financial statements and you know, often, you, like who has, who has adopted IFRS thus far? It's, it's been other countries. And so when you look at the financial statements from other countries, there may be, they may be doing things a certain way and you got to try and go through that and say, well, are they doing that just because that's the situation um, in their country and that's just the way they do things? Or is that a requirement under, under IFRS? So as we go through, we'll try and debunk some of those myths and what is required and what isn't and, and that sort of thing. Condensed versus complete. Um, this is something we've seen in a lot of statements that are followed. Um, it'll say condensed consolidated financial statements or complete consolidated financial statements. What that's referring to is, um, you'll know in Canada, what you do with your quarterlies is you sort of piggyback off of your annual statements. So when you do your quarterlies, you're not gonna put in a full set of your um, significant accounting policies. You're not gonna put in um, tables that cover off the comparative year um, when you get into the notes of it. But you just sort of focus on the quarter that's in question. Um, so that, that's kind of what they're talking about when they say condensed. A complete set is a set, like an annual set, where it talks about the current year, it talks about the prior year, you have all your account policies in there, it has everything. So that's, that's the difference between condensed and complete. When it comes to um, your first quarter under IFRS, um, you're not going to be able to piggyback off exactly off of your annuals because your the last annual you did has all your Canadian Canadian accounting policies. So what you're need, going to need to do in there is you need to put in a full set, like a note two, probably where you would have it, a full set of your significant accounting policies, but the IFRS ones, not the ones that um, may cause adjustments. You're going to talk about that later. But up in note two, just your basic IFRS accounting policies that. 
that the company has uh, adopted going forward. Um, so you're going to need to see that in your quarterly. And that would probably, if, or would like to be in all of your quarterlies, your first quarter, your second quarter, and your third quarter. Your quarterlies on the next year, of course, now you can pay back off your annuals because you'll have that in there. Um, but outside of outside of putting in, um, so just sorry, can you guys hear me in the back there? Is that loud enough? Okay, good. Um, outside of putting in those, you you might still go with a condensed set, i.e., being uh, tables that only relate to that quarter and so on. So that that's the difference between those. Two. The last point you just have to say up in um, I don't know one or two, just that uh, it's in compliance with IAS 34. Now, actually, sorry.